We're going to be talking about convergence today. Okay, so this is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Good. All right. All God's people here send their greetings. Are we all together? Amen? Amen. All right. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen? Amen. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, so let's pray together. Father, thank you for your, your, um, your powerful word. Uh, we bless it today. Uh, we pray that you may give us, you may give us a revelation, that you may uh, just bestow upon us understanding and clarity about what you desire to do in our lives. So, Father, speak to us freely, and may our lives be uh, entirely surrendered to you as uh, as you, uh, you begin to do what you desire. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Glory to God. All right. So uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to introduce this subject today, uh, starting in this passage, because we're actually going to be all over Scripture today. But uh, I think this, this passage is, is a good starting point because it, um, it illustrates God's intent um, with, with humanity. Um, so this is, this is Paul, uh, at the very end of his letter. So this is, a this is kind of, uh, like an outro to, to his, his, at least this section of his letter, because this isn't quite the end of the book, uh, of, um, uh, actually this is the 13th chapter is the end of the book of second, second Corinthians. So essentially Paul is saying just goodbye. That's, that's, that's his way of saying, all right, be well and take care. If, if this was in today's language, it would probably be written, you know what, Paul, you know what, Corinthian church, take it easy. Uh, so Paul was, was giving his, his, his final word to the Corinthian church. And in conclusion, this, this ending as, as a, as a, as a, uh, how do you, what do you call it, uh, it uh, in, on an email when you, when you say, huh? A signature. A signature right, at the signature. When he, there's, there's, um, it's not quite signature. It's um, a pleasantry. When at the end of an email you write sincerely or, uh, you know, best regards and then you write your signature. That's kind of what Paul is doing. This is, this is a courtesy. Uh, this is a pleasantry. And Paul, Paul is saying, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, this passage is, is powerful to me because it illustrates Paul's desire for the church, for the Corinthian church. Now, the Corinthian church was an interesting church for us to talk about, especially as it comes as it, in regards to the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Because the Corinthian church, if you read through Paul's letters, and if you read a little bit of history, if you do your research, you'll find out that the Corinthian church was a church that operated in many of the spiritual gifts. It was abundant in the manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit, but it lacked in, 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 in uh, demonstrations of love. So Paul's rebuke to the Corinthian church was to say that, listen, it doesn't matter if you have prophecy, if you speak in many tongues, if you, if you have all of this power, or at least apparent power, if you experience all of this apparent supernatural, but if you don't have love, it doesn't matter because love is the greater gift. So Paul, Paul is, is, is teaching them how to not fall in love so much with the things of the spirit as much as fall in love with the spirit come on does that make sense and that is a tendency we have as uh, as not we revive community church per se but the church in general especially the pentecostal churches uh, a, a tendency we have is to fall in love and have great desire for the things of god the things of god now i'm not saying we should reject the things of god in by no means we ought to desire truly the kings of god the things of god but it's a problem when we desire the things of god the things of the spirit the manifestation of his presence more so than he himself and that is what Paul is trying to get at and Paul at the end of, of he writes two letters to the same church defending his 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 apostleship and 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 defending uh the 
the necessity that the church needed to realign itself with the, the, the word of God and not allow for external things to hinder their relationship with the Holy Spirit. So Paul is writing to them and at the end of this letter he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, what's striking to me is how he breaks this down. So first of all, he makes it clear that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in essence. They're, they're one. So one is not greater than the other. One is not more intense or more powerful than the other. They're all three persons that together make the Godhead, the, the Trinity. So he puts them in the same level, in the same plane. Okay, he says, the, may the grace of, of the Lord, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's just like what Jesus said to his disciples when he was giving them the great commission. He says, you should go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see in various instances of scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together in the same, in the same level. They are manifested in the same level. Even though they have different uh, functions as far as revelation to humanity. Uh, we're not going to go deta uh, in detail into that right now. I think our fast devotionals really cover that. Uh, um, it cover covers that piece of it. And I think there's good explanation on it if you have any questions. But my intent is to focus on what he, he prays over the Corinthian church about each person of the Trinity. He says, about the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that his grace may be with you. His grace. Now, what is, what is grace? Grace is, is unmerited favor. Is a, a level of favor that you received, but you did not deserve. It's grace. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. It's grace. And, and, and grace is, is something you can't work for. You receive freely. And, and you have to acknowledge that it is freely given and has been freely received. Grace is, 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 the, uh, is, is what Paul even describes. Or not he really he describes, but he gives us insight into a prayer that he is making to the Lord. And he says, Lord, uh, please remove this thorn from my flesh. Lord, give me, give, me, um, um, give me deliverance from this struggle that I'm in. And, and, and he gives us insight into the answer that God gives him. He says, Paul, I'm not removing anything. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. In other words, grace is that which covers us for us to face every struggle we go through. Grace is what girds our legs. Grace is what strengthens us. Grace is what covers us in what pleases God. Okay, because our nature doesn't please God. So what do we need to do? We need to cover ourselves with grace. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see who we were. He sees what grace has caused us to become. Does that make sense? Okay, so he says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. Love here is agape, which is unconditional love. The unconditional love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And that's what I want to focus on. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Because both with Jesus Christ and God the Father. He says things that are given. Grace is given. Love is given. But fellowship is not given. Fellowship is a two-way street. I can't. I can give you grace. If, if, uh, if you, I, I don't know, say you, you borrow money from me and, 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 and don't get any ideas now, but say you borrow, you borrow some money from me and the next week you come to pay me, I say to you, listen, I, I give you grace. You don't have to pay it back. Uh, and, and that's, that's grace. I can give you grace. You don't have to consent. I can give you grace. I can give you love and there does not have to be consent. I can give you love. Even if you don't, even if somebody doesn't love me back, I can still give love. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay. But fellowship is not given without, without reciprocity. Okay. Reciprocity is when a, 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 somebody else 
uh, how somebody else retributes, how somebody else acts in, 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 um, in, um, in reaction to what you do. Does that make sense? Okay, so fellowship requires reciprocity. So I can't give you fellowship. We can together enter into fellowship. Does that make sense? That's why the picture of the table is so prominent in scriptures. The, the picture of the table. That's why when Jesus uh, is giving uh, the, the communion to his disciples and giving this ordinance to the church, he does it around a table. Around a table. That's when the bread and the wine is, 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 is observed. And that's when we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he said, 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, uh, 11, verse 23. He says, uh, uh, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that when the, the, night that, the same night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he also took bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in other words, uh, he is doing uh, an act of remembering Jesus Christ, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus all around a table. And a table symbolizes exactly that, fellowship, fellowship. You do not sit at a table with people you don't have fellowship with. I was, I was giving you guys a, an illustration a couple weeks ago about a time I, 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 was, I was going about my day running errands and whatnot. And, and uh, um, I, I got a little window and, and I was right by a restaurant. I said, you know what? I'm going to grab a bite to eat because I'm not going to have an opp another opportunity to eat today. So I sat down at a, um, like a restaurant that you go and the people kind of serve you. It's kind of like a buffet, but the people serve you. And, and, and I, I grabbed my plate of food and I sat down and the place was packed. And it was one free table with four chairs. And I sat down on one end. And I was, you know, I was going at it. I was going to town because I was hungry. Uh, and, and I was eating. And, and, and this, this guy came around and he was looking for a seat. And he was looking for a seat. There was no open seats except for in my table. So my table, he came, he approached. And, and I, I told him, you know what, if, if you'd like. If you don't, if you're not bothered by it, feel free to sit down. You can, you can eat here. He said, "Oh, you don't mind?" I said, "No, not at all, man. Take a seat." So he, see, I, I sit down on one extremity of the table. He sits down on the other extremity of the table. And we're, we're eating together at the same table, but it's awkward. It's weird, you know. It's weird because we don't really have anything to talk about, and I don't know why. But if you if you sit with a stranger on a bench. You can talk. It's not awkward. It's, it's okay. But if you sit at a table to eat with a complete stranger, it's, it's different. It's different. You know, so I tried kind of engaging into conversation. And, you know, when you're eating, you ask things at the wrong time every time. You know how when you're eating and the waitress comes and, oh, is everything okay? And you've just put a big, you know, a big bite of food in your mouth. And you, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. That conversation was, it was awkward. Uh, we were both strongly desiring for that awkwardness to end, you know. Because we didn't have fellowship. That wasn't, fe you don't sit down at a table with people you don't have fellowship with. It's weird. It's awkward. It's odd. And, and therefore, the table symbolizes this, this level of fellowship. And that's why communion happens around a table. And the table is so prominent in the New Testament. You know, the, the says, uh, do this whenever you eat, whenever you drink in remembrance of me. Jesus said it. Truly, in fact, communion was not supposed to be something we do once a month. Communion is meant for us to do every time we eat together. Do this whenever you eat it, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever we sit down to eat, we're supposed to remember Christ. And that's when we have fellowship. Do you follow what I'm saying? Uh, and, and the psalmist said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So, so the table is a place of fellowship with God. It's a place of victory. It's a place of affirmation. It's a place of sharing. It's a place of communion. So, so, so fellowship and communion is, is so strongly in scripture. And Paul says, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
What does that mean? It means that fellowship is not something he does to us. Fellowship is something he does with us. Can I say that again? Come on. Fellowship is not something he does to us. Fellowship is something he does with us. And I wonder, church, I know that we are receptive of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because we know we need it. How many of you do not need grace? Come on. Come on. We need grace every day. We need grace every hour. We need grace every minute. You needed grace coming here today. You did. Uh, come on, somebody. Imagine, imagine if your thoughts were automatically published on Twitter. Without vetting. Without nothing. Every thought you had was automatically published on Twitter. Automatically. Published on, on, on Instagram and Facebook. Nobody uses Facebook anymore. But, you know. Imagine. That's how much grace you need. <laughs> we need grace. And we know we need grace. So we're receptive of it. We need love. Come on. Does anybody like to be loved? Yes. Come on somebody. Yes. The love of God. The love of God who gave it all. He loved the world so much. He loved you so much. That he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believeth in him. Shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is John 3.16. Love is. Everybody likes to be loved. Because when you're loved. You are the recipient. Of of of. of of gifts, of pleasant things. You are the recipient of the good nature of that other person. Love, oh, that's beautiful, it's powerful, that's amazing. Love is when somebody else puts you ahead of themselves. It's sacrificial, it's all-encompassing, it's beautiful, it's, it's nurturing, it's completing. Oh, love is so powerful. It's, I want the love of God. Yes, yes, that's obvious. We all want the love of God. But the thing we don't fully understand or grasp is the fellowship. Because it's easy for us to receive grace because it's free. It's easy for us to receive his love because it's unconditional. You know what unconditional means? It means that there, is no, there are no conditions to it. There are no conditions to it. He loves everyone equally. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've been. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. He loves you all the same. So, so, so grace is unmerited. It's undeserved. Love is unconditional. But fellowship has to be nurtured fellowship needs investment you cannot be in fellowship with me for instance if you don't put in the time if i'm the only one that texts you if i'm the only one who calls you if i'm the only one who gives you gifts if i'm the only one who shows up when you need me to if i'm but, but when i when i text you i get no response when i call you i get no response when i when i when i need you i don't have your presence your time or your resources we're not going to be in fellowship for very long because fellowship is all about reciprocity it's all about give and take. It's, there, there's a balance to that. It has to be nurtured. It has to be nurtured. Have you ever, have you ever been in, in a, a relationship with somebody as a friend or, or even relatives sometimes? A person that thinks they enjoy a level of fellowship with you that they in fact don't? Have you ever? You know? Person that comes to your house and it's not that you don't think fondly of them. You do, but but you know, they're an acquaintance. They're not really a friend quite yet. But they show up to your house and they open your refrigerator. Good God almighty. Oh, that ticks me off. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I kind of like you, but, you know, we're not like that. We're not like that, like that, you know? You know, you know when the level of fellowship is, is off, the level of perceived fellowship is a little off. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, I wonder, I wonder, is, is, is the level of fellowship that you enjoy with the Holy Spirit, does it reflect the reality of what you need? The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know I, I said that today's message is entitled Convergence. And convergence, it, to converge means to come together. And I, I, I'm going to explain that. Because, and this is, I really need the help of the Holy Spirit to kind of break this down because this, this thought has really been, it has been ugh, consuming me from the inside over these last three to four weeks. I've been really been heavy with this in my heart. It's, it's been so speaking to me so strongly. This to me, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and hear me out, just if you could just devote your attention to this for another 15 minutes and I'll be I'll wrap it up. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is not something only to the New Testament. When Paul speaks about fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it, that's not news. It's not something new. If if we look throughout scripture, we'll find out that since creation God has desired fellowship with man. Man as in mankind, not just men, but, but mankind. God has desired it. God has desired it and God has invested in it. So, so, so think of this. God is, first of all, he doesn't need us in order to be God. He is God all by himself. He is absolute, sovereign, perfect, complete. He needs nothing else in order to be God. He was God. He is God while you're here on earth. He was God before you were ever born. Before, you know, 1980, 60, <laughs> Before, you know, before 19, <laughs> in my case, before 1989, that's right, 32 years ago, 33 on the 25th, I got 10 days to my birthday, prepare yourselves. <laughs> I'm going to be the age of Christ in 10 days. That's wild. You know, before 1989, God was still God, Matthews. He didn't become God, you know. He didn't become God then. He was still God. After I'm gone, you know, whenever that is, if God doesn't take his church, whenever that is, after I'm gone, he's going to continue to be God. He doesn't need me in order to be God. He's been God. But yet... The Bible begins with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was a formless void. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, hovered over the face of the deep. So, so right off the top, we see God creating an environment for what? An environment for fellowship. And the Holy Spirit is already in operation in the very beginning, in creation. Nothing has been created yet. Nothing. In the beginning, God, boom, created the heavens and the earth. All of a sudden, there is something, which is what? It's the seed to an environment for fellowship. And the Holy Spirit is preparing that environment. He's hovering over the face of the deep. 
when it's formless and void. By the way, my friend, if there is anything that's formless in your life, allow the Holy Spirit to hover over you. If there is anything that's void in your heart or in your life or in your mind, allow the Holy Spirit to make His presence known to you. Because wherever the Holy Spirit is, whatever is void is filled with something. Whatever is dark is, has to light up. Whatever, whatever is it that is, that is, that is formless enters into to the form that God desires with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to make His presence known in your life. He hovers over the face of the deep. Uh, and, and the Bible says that God said, let there be light. And pff, there was light. I don't know if it was the big bang, the small bang, the little bang. I don't know what it was, but there was something. Because light came to appear out of nothing. God created it. Good God of mercy, I feel like preaching today. Woo! My God. And all of a sudden, uh, God begins a sequence, a sequence of, 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 of spoken words of creation to put together an environment for fellowship. And he creates Eden. And in Eden, he puts man. And out of man, he takes the woman. Woman, he takes out of man. And together, first of all, he creates man. And then he says about man, he says about Adam, he says, it is not good for men to be alone. <laughs> Why isn't it good? Because we need fellowship. Somebody say fellowship. fellowship. Somebody else say fellowship. fellowship. We need fellowship. He says it's not good. It's not good. It isn't good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. So you know what? I'm going to give him earthly fellowship. Nurturing, relationship, help, assistance. Everybody knows man needs help. Uh, we can't do a whole lot by ourselves. He gives him Eve. Now, now watch this. Let's go go with me to go with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter three. My God, is this blessing anybody? Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter three, verse verse seven. Genesis chapter three, verse seven. <clears throat> so, so actually, let's go to chapter to chapter two. Let's go to chapter two first. Genesis chapter two, verse. Genesis chapter two, verse fifteen. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Oh my God. Help me, Holy Spirit. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God makes an environment for fellowship. And he says to the man, he says, listen, you will care for this environment. This is the place of fellowship between you and I. And you will care for it. You will tend to it. And it must be cared for. And there are conditions to our fellowship. Let me tell you something, church. There are always conditions to fellowship. There are no conditions to grace. There are, all you have to do is believe. There are no conditions to love. All you have to do is be born. But there are conditions to fellowship. So he says, Adam, I created this environment for you. You didn't, you didn't do anything in order for me to give it to you. So here it is. This is grace. It's freely given. Adam, I love you dearly. That is why I created you. And that's unconditional love. But Adam, in order for us to remain in fellowship, you have to tend to this garden. And you cannot eat of that fruit. The day you eat of it, it's optional. 
It's optional. Fellowship with me, Adam, is not obligated. It's optional. If you want to exit, if you want to quit it, if you want to end and terminate our fellowship, all you got to do is eat of that fruit. Does, that, does, does this make sense, anybody? So, so, so he says, Adam, tend to it. Take care of this environment, which is our fellowship. But Pastor Diego, how do you know that there's fellowship? I'm so glad you asked. I'm so, so glad you asked. You're very perceptive about the questions I want you to ask. Verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. When, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. When the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. In the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So, so listen, listen to this. Don't read ahead. Listen to this. Oh my God, help me Holy Ghost. So God makes this environment of fellowship. And says, says to Adam, says, listen, Adam, you care for this. This is the most precious thing that you have. Because this is where we engage in fellowship. Are you with me, Adam? This Eden is our table. Eden is the place we sit together f- to fellowship, to have relationship, to share. This is the place where revelation occurs. This is the place where nurturing occurs. This is the place where comfort occurs. This is the place. This is the place where I make myself known to you. You care for this. Care for it. And Adam was reckless. And both Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that God had told them not to eat from. And the Bible says that they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and kind of covered themselves. And then the Bible says, verse 8. They, they, they heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So in other words, the, as the sun was setting, because the, the Jewish day doesn't begin at sunrise. The Jewish day begins at sunset. So, so God would come to Adam as the day was ending and the new day was beginning. Are you with me? That's why the Bible says night, morning, the first day. It's because the day begins at night. Does that make sense, somebody? All right. All right. All right. Whoo, I'm so excited about this word. Oh, God. So, so Adam hears God walking around the garden. Now, why was God walking in the garden? Because it was the place of fellowship. God expected to find Adam because it was it was it was it was customary it was it was it was it was, it was um it was habitual for them to be together how do you know this pastor diego look at this verse 9 but god the lord god called the man where are you why would god ask adam where are you if god didn't expect adam to be somewhere specific The reason why God was saying, Adam, where are you? You're not at the place we usually meet. What happened? I'm here for our moment of fellowship every day. But you're not where I expect you to be. Where are you, Adam? And church, I tell you today, the Holy Spirit is asking this of many of us today. He is asking, where are you? I'm here where I told you I'd be. I'm here where I usually am. I'm here for our conversation, for revelation, for nurturing, for love, for peace, for confidence, for strengthening. I'm here for you. Where are you for me? 
He says, Adam, where are you? I expect to find you, Adam. And then and in this first place of fellowship, we see man failing God. My God. This is the biggest sign to me that God intended for fellowship since the very beginning. Since the very beginning. And it happened so many more times again. I'm out of time almost, but you know, in, in, with Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, God meets Moses. Put it up for me on the screen real quick, please. Exodus chapter 3, God, so after this moment, when, when man, when Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, they're expelled from the place of fellowship, God now starts to, to, to put together a strategy to reestablish fellowship. God is reestablishing fellowship. So he calls this man Moses. So the Lord called out to the man and said, no, uh, uh, Exodus chapter, chapter 3, please. Exodus chapter 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the, the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He took the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Uh, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Uh, when the Lord saw that he had um, uh, gone over to look, God called out from, uh, called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Take your sandals off your feet for, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. So now we see God making arrangements for fellowship to start again. Now, now, it, it, it happens differently now. There are restrictions now. There are filters now. Because the nature of man was no longer receptive or able to withstand fullness of fellowship with God as Adam enjoyed. So now there are, there are filters in place. Before God would walk in the garden. Adam, where are you? This was our meeting place. Where are you, Adam? This was, this was the standard. Now, things changed. Now, God is, is hidden. I put this in quotes. But, but he, is, he is within the bush as a fire. He is speaking to Moses. And Moses, take your sandals off, Moses. Don't, 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 come, don't, don't come too close, Moses. Oh, 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 okay, okay, God. Okay, I'll take, I'll take, my, I'll take my sandals off. Okay, God. So, so Moses, come, come closer. But, but don't come too close. Don't come too close. Because Moses, we're just in the beginning stages of reestablishing fellowship. And so it happens that, that God calls Moses. Moses takes the people of Israel away from Egypt and now into the land of, of, of the promise. And on their way there, God reveals himself to the people and, and, and tells Moses to build the tabernacle. This is Exodus chapter 40, verse 33. Exodus chapter 40, verse 33. Exodus chapter 40, verse 33. Next, Moses set up the surrounding courtyard for the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate of the courtyard. So Moses finished the work, period. Now the tabernacle is complete. The tabernacle, the tabernacle, tabernacle means the place of meeting, the meeting tent. My God, the meeting place. Ooh, my God, my God, my God, the meeting place. God makes a structure in the desert in order to reveal himself to the people of Israel. And what happens after they finish the work, Fabi? 
What happens? They finish the work. The tabernacle's up. The curtains are up. Everything is up. Everything is working. The priests are dressed. Everything is set. Everything is set for communion, for fellowship. What happens? Next verse, please. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle immediately. Why? Because God was eager. God was expectant. To have an environment ready again for fellowship. And now the tabernacle becomes the main symbol of fellowship between God and man. What is it? It's the place of convergence. You thought I forgot about my thing, didn't you? But it's the place of convergence. It's the place where man and God meet together again for fellowship. Good God of mercy. I'm preaching better than you're helping me today. The place of convergence. Come on, is anybody with me? Amen. But the tabernacle was meant to be a temporary structure. It was meant to be a temporary structure. It was mobile. Why? Because throughout the desert, the people needed to follow the cloud. So the Bible says that when the cloud started to move, everybody had to pick up their things and start moving with it. Because God doesn't move with us. We move with God. Oh, you, you, you lost your chance right there. I said, God doesn't follow us. We follow God. Come on, somebody. You got to help me a little better than that. I said, we are the ones who must follow God. God isn't following anybody. Woo. Hallelujah. So, so they, they had to have a mobile structure, a structure that could be taken apart and set back up. Because once the cloud stopped, they had to set up shop again. So the cloud would move and then the cloud would stop. The cloud stopped. And that was a sign from God saying, this is the place where you're going to stay for a little while. So they would set up shop and they would set up the tabernacle again. And once the tabernacle was set up, boom, the glory of God would come back again. And they would be there for a little while. And then the cloud would start moving slowly. Oh, 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 Moses, Moses, look at that. I think the cloud is moving. The cloud is moving. It's time to grab our things. Let's grab everything. Come on, the cloud is moving. Come here, come here, let's go. We, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. The cloud is moving. The cloud is moving. The cloud, the cloud is moving. You got to go. The cloud is moving. You got to go. The cloud is moving. You got to go. You got to move with the spirit. You got to move with him. If you want to remain in fellowship, move with the cloud. Yes. 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 Woo. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Woo. My God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So that was a temporary structure. So therefore, God, God intended to build a permanent structure. So we have Eden, a place of fellowship. We have Moses being called to reignite the flame of fellowship. We have the tabernacle built as a structure to be the significance, the meaning, the symbol of the meeting place. So much so that in the tabernacle, there were things that pointed to Eden. The lampstand, for instance, pointed to the tree of life. There was, there was, there was, uh, there was, um, there was things all over the walls pointing to Eden. Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't have a lot of time to show you the significance and the resemblance between the tabernacle and Eden. I don't have that kind of time today. Maybe we'll do it in the coming weeks. But I got to show you today how these things are all connected. It's God trying to rescue the level of fellowship he had with man back in the garden. Come on, is this helping anybody? Is this helping anybody? Come on, somebody. So, so they had to then... Build a permanent structure. A permanent structure. So let's see what happens. This is David now. We're fast forwarding to King David. He gathers all the materials. And his son Solomon, who was king after him, built 
temple, a monumental structure that communicated the glory of this great God was now completed. Now we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. If you read chapter 6, you're going to see what happens as they finish building the, the temple. Now it's not a moving structure anymore. Now it's fixed. It's fixed in place. And by the way, you know, you know where in Jerusalem there's the, the wailing wall? Where, where the rabbis are, are just constantly praying in the wailing wall? You know what I'm talking about in Jerusalem? That is the, that's, that wall is the foundation of the temple of Solomon. It's that temple mount. It's the same location. Solomon builds the temple and he makes sacrifices. And I wish I had the time to go through it all, but I don't. He makes the sacrifices in chapter 7 verse 1. says, when Solomon finished uh, uh, praying, when he finished praying, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. My God, my God. Look at this, verse 2. Come on, somebody. Woo! you got to shout glory after this. The priests were not able to enter the Lord's temple because the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. Verse 3. Verse 3. All the Israelites were watching. And when the fire descended and the glory of the Lord came on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement. They worshipped and praised the Lord for He is good. For His faithful love endures forever. Amen. This, was, this was the demonstration of the glory of God. The, demo, the demonstration of God's of God's compliance to man's desire to reestablish fellowship. So, so all of this that I, everything I said right now today, all of this was actually an introduction. This wasn't my sermon. This was the introduction to my sermon. Because I wanted to show you the importance of the temple. The temple was a place of convergence mm -hmm. where God and man converged into one place. Wow. It was imperfect. It was not perfect. It was imperfect. It was because it was a system. It, was, it acted as a filter. It acted as a filter because man was not able to withstand God's presence raw, uninhibited. Oh my God, we needed that filter. We needed the priests. We needed the sacrifices. We needed the physical structure. We needed the veils. We needed the curtains. We needed it all because we couldn't handle it with the naked eye. So God put together a system in place in order for us to have a place of convergence again. Pastor Diego, why does this matter so much? Because remember what Paul wrote? Put it, put it back on the screen for us. 2 Corinthians 13, 13. Second Corinthians 13, 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's, it all has to do with fellowship. Say fellowship. Fellowship. So the temple was a place of fellowship, a place of convergence. Now why is this so significant. It's because of what's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When Paul says, 
don't you know that you are God's sanctuary? Put the King James Version for me up, please. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. <laughs> See, we use this text in, in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians rather, Paul is talking about the need for us to police ourselves, and he is he is talking to the church about sexual immorality. When he says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Put it up for me, please. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So here he is speaking about sexual immorality. He's saying, listen, you cannot defile your body. So, so we use this passage to, to talk to people about why you can't smoke or why you can't, you can't use drugs and whatnot because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You got to take care of yourself. You got to go to the gym. You got you to gotta keep your weight in check. You can't be having diabetes and stuff like that because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. We use it for that, but, but, but that's not all it means. What, what this means is your body is the place of convergence. My God, God desires to have fellowship with humanity. So God, in the Old Testament, he established, Geraldo, a meeting place that was the tabernacle. And then later, the temple. He established a meeting place. In the beginning, it was Eden. He established a meeting place. But now, he still desires fellowship with humanity. But there is no one meeting place. You are the meeting place. You are the place of convergence. You are the place. Listen to me church. You are the place where God meets those around you. You are the place of convergence. And that is the significance of the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In other words, before we needed filters, we needed veils, we needed curtains, we needed, we needed goats and, and, and bullocks, we needed sacrifices, we needed altars, we needed all of that. But now the Holy Spirit, Bill, he abides in you. You are that environment of fellowship. You are the place of convergence. So if God wants to reveal himself to your neighbor, who don't know him how will he meet them he will meet them through you because you are the place of convergence you are the place where man and God meet together again for fellowship good God of mercy you are the place of convergence you are the temple what the temple was in the Old Testament, you are today. The glory of God rests upon you. Not this place. This place is just a physical gathering place. This isn't the meeting place. The reason why the glory of God shows up here is not because this place is special. It's because you are the place of convergence. You are what attracts the glory of God. The reason why the cloud of glory rests upon this house is not because of this building. It's because of you. You are the place. You are the temple. You are the sanctuary. And we ought to treat ourselves as such. You can stand on your feet. I'm done. You are the place. Come on, high five three people around you and tell them you are the place. 
Come on, come on, come on. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. Say, you are the place. You are the place. You are the place of convergence. You are the place of glory. You are the place of the presence. You are the place where God meets earth. You are the place of convergence. My God. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. My God, you are the place. You are the place. The thing is, we live our lives looking for the place, not knowing that we are the place. Oh my God, I wish I had the time to break this down to you. We spend our entire lives looking for the place, praying to God, saying, God, reveal your glory. God, show me your glory. God this, God that, God the other. But the thing is, you're not looking for the place. You are the place. Once that changes in your mind, once your mindset changes and your perception adapts to the fact that the glory of God rests upon you, everything shifts. And that's what I call a paradigm shift. It's when your focus, your perception, your, your, your attitude, everything about you, your posture, everything changes and shifts. Because now you have clarity through revelation. That you are the place. Oh, don't let the devil lie to you. You are the place. Oh, don't let the devil tell you where you are unworthy. You are the place. Not because of your beautiful green eyes and your luscious locks. No, 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 no. You are the place because God picked you. My God. Is this speaking to anybody? You are the place. You are the place. Now I want you to do something with me. I want you to lift both hands up to the heavens. And I want you to make a declaration. Say, I believe. Say it loud. Say, I believe I am the place of convergence. Say this loudly. Say, God, manifest your glory in me. Say, in me. In me. And that's exactly why we cannot ever neglect our fellowship with the Holy Spirit if this blessed you clap your hands somebody I want to pray with you but if you'd like a specific prayer I'm going to call forward evangelist Geraldo pastor Fernanda they're going to be up here for a few minutes after the end of my prayer To pray with you. To lay hands on you. Because maybe. You've been living your life. As if you were a place of shame. A place of deceit. A place. Of chaos. And incompleteness. And you don't. You didn't realize before. That you are actually the place of convergence. And what you are looking for. Is not without you. It's within you. I believe the presence of God will manifest itself before you today. Not just before you, but it will manifest itself in you. And just as Solomon described in the inauguration of the temple, that fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. I declare that the fire of the Holy Spirit will come down upon you and consume every impurity and every impure thought and action, ah, my God, to establish itself inside of your heart because you are the place of convergence. You are the place that God shows. That's why we need the Holy Spirit just as the earth was formless and void. We were formless and void. But back then, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep and caused what was voided to be filled, what was chaos to be ordered. And just like that, the Holy Spirit wants to hover over you. And fellowship with the Holy Spirit will bring order to that which is chaotic, will bring peace to that which is troubled, will bring healing to that which is sick, will bring Bring truth to every lie of the enemy. 
Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you because this has been a place of convergence. A place where your people meet you. But God, we want our lives, our bodies to be a places of convergence. Where you meet the world through us. Where you reveal yourself. Where you show yourself true and strong. Where you show your love and your grace and your favor. In Jesus name. I rebuke every thought of depression. Every thought of inferiority. I rebuke it right now. And I declare that your people may be set free and delivered. And delivered and delivered from everything that binds them in a place of constant servitude to their sinful past. God I declare and I release this word of freedom. Declaring to them they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit abides in them. So Father, set them free right now in Jesus' name and put a hunger in our hearts, a thirst in us for your presence and for your word in Jesus' name. Father, lead us home in safety. Multiply unto us your grace and your favor continuously and give us a powerful week of victory. We open up this second week of the fast, God, with joy in our hearts. Strengthen your people in Jesus' name. May the blessings of the Lord God, the Father, the grace of Christ, the Son, and may the comfort of the Holy Spirit be upon His church today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands, somebody. If you want prayer, don't delay. Come forward. We'd like to pray for you in Jesus' name.